I grew up in Long Beach, California. Uh, my parents operated a cleaning shop there. In 1932, we moved to Los Angeles, California, Southern California. Uh, I entered grammar school there. Uh, we it created some interest then in, in model airplanes. In fact, there was a model airplane shop nearby, and I was building real balsa wood, rubber band for propellers, all type of thing, and created an interest in aircraft about that time. And nearby was an airport called Dicer Field, and I'd go out there and watch the old airplanes fly and, and never got to fly in one at that time. Of course, I was still young. But Dicer Field became the LAX, LAX airport, so I was close to that all the time. I went through grammar school there and went to high school, met my wife in high school. This was, we graduated in summer of 41. And if you recall, in December of 41 was that infamous day, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. Prior to that time, of course, the war had started in Europe and we knew there was a war coming on. And I was still interested in flying and hoped I could become a aviation cadet. I took night school as I graduated in anticipation of taking the very test to go into the Air Force. Prior to that time, they insisted you had a degree, and I did not have a degree, and many of us did not. They learned that in having a degree in maybe agriculture or phys ed really didn't prepare you for being a pilot. So they created a program called College Training Detachment, and we were the first of that group, and they inducted us into the Air Force in sometime in 42 that I went in. When we graduated, we had no assignment where we were gonna fly at all. We were to real, after our vacation, we reported to Columbia, South Carolina, where they had B-25s. We thought maybe this is gonna be it. They said, no, you're not scheduled to fly the B-25s. You're gonna get some assignment later on. To get our flying time, we had to fly Piper Cubs to get our flying time in. After about uh, a month or two, we moved to Greenville, North Carolina, South Carolina, and we went through preparation to go overseas. We went from there to uh, Newport News, Virginia, boarded a ship. We had no idea where we were gonna go, had no idea what we were gonna fly, and there was exactly 100 of us on these orders on two different ships. After about eight days, we came in by the Rock of Gibraltar. We thought we were gonna go to North Africa. We didn't, we went to Naples, Florida, Naples, Italy. We spent about two weeks there at a replacement depot one day, a group of B-25s came over and picked us up and took us to Corsica. I never even heard of Corsica before. We were uh, replacement pilots for other pilots who had finished their missions, and they waited for us to show up so they could come home, not realizing we had no hours in that airplane at all. So we got a quick checkout of the airplanes after probably about five weeks because we had to get indoctrination, build our tents and everything else, we started flying Copilot. And at that time we had a, a tour was, was 50 missions. That subsequently changed to 60 and then 70. Anywho, uh, after quite a few missions, my, another gentleman who was part of our group of 100, and he, he and I were flying Copilot and pilot changing off each other. We, from Corsica we were able to fly into France into Austria, into Italy. At that time, most of our missions were in Italy because we were driving the Germans up the boot of Italy, up through which was going to be Austria, back to Germany. Our mission was to bomb all the bridges, all the marshalling yards, everything we could, supply lines and everything, to halt their evacuation of, of uh, Italy. Probably about three months later, we started bombing in the Brenner Pass. Now, the Brenner Pass, is a uh, Alps in Austria that's about 70 to 75 miles long from 20 to 30 miles wide at different points. The ground elevation varies from 5,000 to 5,500 feet. And our mission then was to knock out all the bridges, the tunnels, marshalling yards, everything else again to stop the Germans because that was their main supply route to Italy for the troops and their main evacuation group out of Italy. Probably out of my up to 68 missions, 45 of them were all in the Brenner Pass, because it was really becoming very desperate to stop them 
because we didn't know this, but the big plans was going to be D-Day, and they didn't want any Germans to get back up in that area to support that, that uh, defense. The Brenner Pass was a difficult target to find because you're flying over the Alps. Sometimes you have to reach 15, 16,000 feet. We had no oxygen. We had no heating equipment. And you had to fly that long for a while to get to your target area. And the navigators had a hell of a job trying to find out where to approach the Brenner Pass to go in so you find the target real quick and do a 180 and come out. You never could have flew all the way across the pass because ultimately there were 560 gun sites in there, guns, 88 millimeter guns, and 105 millimeter guns, and 40 millimeter guns. All could reach your altitude very easily. We never surprised them. They knew we were coming. They were like, shooting like ducks in a barrel. The uh, ability for the Germans to be accurate was, was, was astounding because they had, they had radar, they had proximity fuses, and they would put, put up a box with flax, you had to fly through it, so they'd get you all the time. The uh, missions were so imperative that we blocked them, that we flew probably missions a day, not just ourselves, but somebody in our squadron was, was always up there, or another squadron, or another group, bombing the Brenner Pass. Or well, something else in, on the mission, as I told you before, the pass was 20 to 30 miles wide at certain points, and the elevation was 5,000 to 5,600 feet. We bombed at 10,000 feet. So you look at the difference between 5,500 and 10,000, pretty damn close. Those guns were right up your, you know, where. In many cases, the bomb, the guns were on the sides of the Alps. So they're firing across at you as well as up at you. So our losses were pretty heavy, and that's why we went to the P-47s, and we dropped phosphorus, and phosphorus really got their attention because it not only would it burn everything it touched, but it, it made a big explosion come out like this, and they'd run and hide from this. In fact, the Berlin Sally was saying that any of you troops we catch, we're going to hang because you dropped in phosphorus. But it saved our butts, really. First group over 10 of us that were assigned to the 447th bomb group, group God squadron, uh, alphabetically, so they called us the ABC boys because we're alphabetic ABC. Later on, there was a one of the pilots over there wrote a book on the Junior Bergman of Corsica, talking about all hundred of us that went over there as new ducklings that <laughs> led into the slaughter over there. Anywho, uh, the war ended. We knew the war was about ready to end when we moved to Italy into a place called Falconera. We were closer to the targets. We fly two a day, and after a while, the, the Germans were shooting up instead of just flak, they shoot up flares and all kinds of things, just trying to fill the air with something. And uh, one day, a German Messerschmitt came over and landed at our airfield. And it was a Czechoslovakian pilot who had been in training, and as soon as he got enough training, he just headed right across the Adriatic and gave himself up. Later on, it was other pilots that showed up, giving themselves up, so we knew that something was happening. And it finally did, and the war ended. And uh, I came back to my wife. So it was pretty severe over there for a while, and I'm just uh, glad to survive, because as I said earlier, our first missions were 50, and later on we got about 45, they changed it to 60. And then we got about 50 or so, they changed it to 70. We thought we were gonna die over here because they could leave here forever. What they were doing, they were diverting new pilots to the Pacific Theater, because they were preparing for that one at that time. So we were just there until we get it done. And Warren did, I had 68, so they had to come home. That was that one. When I came back from overseas after World War II, I was reassigned to uh, Arizona, Williams Air Force Base. And I was training bombardiers to fly the new radar bombers for Japan, the invasion of Japan. So I was there for four months, and I flew up. Every other day, I'd fly a five-hour mission up through Los Angeles and all that. On VE day, I was over Los Angeles, over my house, and I buzzed my house, and my wife came out and waved at me. That's exactly where I was. No, it was, it was, you know, you're, number one, you were, the, the two biggest days in my life was one was being classified as a cadet, because you got, got to wear that hat on them, and uh, you stood out, and you knew you're, you're there. And the other one was 
passing each element through primary because you lost half your class at each of the elements. So you get 60 hours of flight time there. Then you go to basic, you lose another half of the class. Then you go to advanced, you lose another half of your class. So you knew you're in a pretty good relative position and you're pretty proud of yourself for doing it. Then you finally get your commission and your wings and that's the big day. Then you get your orders for overseas. <laughs> I came back to my wife. I went to work for Northrop Corporation. Uh, Northrop had a group of 11 L4s that they were using as coastal patrol during the war. And uh, all of us who were ex-pilots all got to fly the L4s. And I joined the Civil Air Patrol at that time and became the California Wing uh, commander of a group in that area. Uh, I liked to fly so much that I joined the reserve at that time, 452nd Bomb Wing. They flew B-25s initially, then they changed to the A-26 Douglas Invader. And who would think that in five years after war, another one started, that'd be Korea. And at that time, I was recalled to Korea to Wart Patterson Air Force Base. And I had a, what they call a mobilization assignment there, which is ahead of time, you have a spot you know you're going to go to. And this was what they call air technical intelligence. And we studied Soviet aircraft, performance, characteristics, and anything to do with the, with the Soviets. And uh, my role is to evaluate some of that information. And I prepared a study on the MiG-15 that was there. Uh, I was the uh, operations or, or executive officer of, the, of, the, of our analysis Water. That lasted till 53, 51 to 53, and I came back to Northrop. As I uh, progressed through my different positions at Northrop, uh, in 1959, they asked me to come back to Dayton and help set up the Dayton office for Northrop, because our business was increasing at that time. So uh, I moved my family back in 59, And see, I was first. I was a operations manager, and I was head of the division, and then I became vice president of the corporation. And I was one that the office reported to me, and we've been there since '59 through '89. When I retired, I had the heart surgery, and I felt after 44 years with Northrop that was enough. So I retired, and gave my activities to other activities in town. Uh, I joined the uh, National Aviation Hall of Fame in the early years, helping get started. Ultimately, I became the chairman and president of that organization. I'm still the chairman emeritus. Uh, we honored all the great aviation pioneers. I had the opportunity of meeting all the astronauts and all the people who mean anything in the aircraft. It was really, really interesting to do.